Well, good evening, and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Shop with Russ. Um, sorry for a little bit of difficulties. Uh, Chad was out in his shop, and his internet connection wasn't that great, so we had to move him. So we were kind of waiting for him to get moved into the house to get his internet connection right. So, uh, But I just wanted to say, tonight we have a bunch of little chopper rooms on the panel, and one big chopper. <laughs> so we're glad to have him. Uh, we'll go ahead right into uh, introductions, which we're going to introduce everybody, and then uh, Chad, the last, I'll introduce you, and pretty well, we'll take over with the show with you. So, starting uh, on my left is Mr. Charles. Go ahead. All right. Uh, I'm Charles Daring. I don't usually wear safety glasses, but I felt obligated to. Um, <laughs> On YouTube, on YouTube, I'm Charles Daring Scroll, and WoodenVisions.com is my website. And under every video on my YouTube, you will find the links to all my social media. If, if you don't go to the website, cool. Thank I'm you. having problems with uh, issues myself over there with YouTube trying to get it going. Uh, next is Mr. Chris, Chris Ahern. Hey guys, I'm Chris Ahern. Um, you can find me on Facebook under the Old Frankie Workshop. And on YouTube under Crystal Wheeler. If you can't find me there, check down at the local pub before I get away from the house. <laughs> and then next, Mr. Dave, Dave Gatton. Thanks, Russ. I'm Dave Gatton. You can find me on YouTube under Dave Gatton, or you can also find me over on Garage Work CNC. Uh, next is Mr. Donald. Donald Matthews. You caught me with a straw in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Donald Matthews. My YouTube channel is Donald Vlogsifies Woodshop. My website is rednecknowhow.com, and you can find all my Instagram and Twitter and all that there on my YouTube channel. Great. And then a man we haven't seen in a while. He's kind of like uh, well, matter one of the few times we saw him, he was actually upside down when he was on the show. So, but uh, he's back tonight. Everything's working. So, Mr. John, John Schaffner. Yes, indeed. He's back with a vengeance. Uh, John Schaffner. Uh, I don't have any YouTube videos or anything like that. You can find me on Facebook, or generally speaking, you can find me sitting here on my bat butt. <laughs> it's good to have you back, though. Well, thank you. It's great to be back. I missed you, all you guys. And then Mr. Patrick from Patrick's Workshop. Oh, you're, we can't hear you. Yep. Uh, all those mic checks he did earlier, now we can't hear them. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right, we'll skip you, Patrick, and you just have to come back or... And then, uh, okay, so the evil Russ on the show is next, Mr. Russ Meadows. Uh, I am the good Russ. <laughs> I am the good Russ. The evil Russ has a beard. <clears throat> uh, my name's Russ Meadows. You can find me on Facebook under that name and also on my Facebook page for the time being till I change it, Rusty Nail Woodworks. Yeah, um... I think you had a problem with, uh, you found out on uh, the internet that that name is actually t taken, right? The, uh, there's a Facebook page with that stinking name that hasn't been done anything to it since 2013. And he's also got the uh, the uh, the domain name, so I, I couldn't use it. So I got to come up with something else. I got some contenders, but I got to think of something. Cool. All right. And then the man of the hour that we've all been waiting for. Uh, the big chopper himself, Mr. Uh, Chad Stanton from Wood Chopping Time. How you doing? Good, good. Hey, thanks, guys, for having us on. Um, I appreciate you giving us the opportunity uh, to be here. Great. And uh, let's not forget Safety Dan. Hey. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> he stays in character, doesn't he? <laughs> Yeah, sorry about not being out in the shop. Um, like you said, we were having a little bit of a reception problem out there. So uh, now we're down actually in my office slash basement. 
uh, the corporate headquarters, if you will. Um, and uh, we might have to deal with my idiotic cat here from time to time. So, <laughs> Cool. Well, I tell you what, uh, I usually get the privilege of being the uh, first, to, uh, first one to ask a question, so uh, I'll go ahead and start off. What got you into woodworking? Um, I started doing woodworking back in um, middle school, you know, junior high, and it was something, I don't even know if it's still done in schools today. Hey, by the way, is there, are you getting some terrible feedback? Uh, we're not, are you? Um, I, I'm just hearing myself, and I hate that, so. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Um, no, as long as, as long as it's okay on your part, but. Uh, so in, in junior high, we had shop class, and uh, one of the one of the first projects I made was one of those uh, bottle openers, you know, and it catches it in the box at the bottom. Uh, back when pop came in bottles with caps, so uh, I still have it actually. It's up in the kitchen, and uh, uh, that really did it for me. Over the summer uh, of that year, I went out and I saved enough money to get a little Black and Decker plastic bandsaw. And I, you know, I made some of these, and I would say I sold them to people, but I'm sure my mom was, you know, helping hawk them for me. Uh, but, but that was kind of, kind of what got me started. And since then, I had always had an interest in woodworking. Always kind of dabbled with it, um, and it, it progressed. It progressed to where uh, I'm a licensed contractor and full-time furniture maker, and um, I, I just love doing it. Great. Yeah, uh, I, I knew that you had done a lot of furniture, and uh, I'd seen some of the videos where you were done some remodeling and stuff from time to time, but uh, I did not know you were also uh, as a contractor. That's great. Yeah, I I used to be an ASC certified mechanic, and um, I like so I like working with my hands. But the problem with being a mechanic was... Uh, sure, you were using your mind to troubleshoot and figure out what the problem was, but you put it back exactly to what factory was, so there was no creative end to it. So when I, well, I actually just quit the job. Had had no other lead, nothing to do, just got fed up and walked out. And, uh, you know, then I quickly realized, that's not a good idea when, <laughs> you know, you got bills to pay. So... I started looking for a job like in the lines of maintenance and whatnot, and uh, no one was really hiring. So I took the last $140 I had, I made some flyers, and I went to really rich, nice neighborhoods and you know put these flyers on the door, handyman type of thing. And uh, there was uh, one call that came in, and they said, can you uh, replace some tile? some tile repair. So I said, sure. No clue how to do tile repair. None. So before I went to the house, I swung by the library. I got a book. And as I'm driving there in my 81 Ford pickup truck, I'm going through the book, you know, how to replace a tile. And when I got there, um, I successfully was able to, you know, butcher my way through it. And I, it, it kept going from there then. Got into the remodeling and, and getting the license and um, people wanted um, the, the finish carpentry is, is where it started going for me, doing trim and crown and built-ins and, you know, just kept growing. That's great. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't get that opportunity to start into something like you enjoy and actually continue to do it. I mean... There's a lot of people out there that have boring jobs that they really can't stand, but in order for you to be able to have a job that you really like and really enjoy is like a very exceptional and very wonderful. Well, you know, I do feel lucky about it because unfortunately I'm probably the most boring man in America because seven days a week I'm in my shop working, but it's not because I necessarily have to, but I, I mean, I do have to, but... Um, I love it. I love being out there, and and even when I go on vacation, I pack. Sounds stupid, but I pack a board and a little chip carving knife because I'll I'll sit around on vacation. You know, you'll find me on the beach somewhere down there in Florida. You know, the only guy chip carving sitting in the sun. 
Uh, well, yeah, you got it bad. I don't do that. <laughs> when, yeah, I leave my work, when I leave my workshop, the tools and the wood stays right here. There you go. I don't take it with me. So, um, now did you? Uh, we had talked about the block planes. Did you bring some of those? Um, I, I can grab them. I got. I had them out there on the bench. I didn't know what direction you wanted to go. Well, we got, um, no, well let's just go on the direction we're going in for right now. I mean, I can grab them. I mean, if you wanted to direct any questions to Safety Dan while I grab them, I can. Uh, it's up uh, to you. Yeah, let's just go with the direction. We'll do more of an interview. Uh, Charles or anybody else got any questions they want to ask? Dan, what brand of cigarettes do you smoke? <laughs> what brand do you got? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, what, you, what they're... Uh... Marlboro. Good deal. Uh I don't know why I'm plugging cigarettes, but anyway, uh, get, get drunk too, kids. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I know this isn't totally related to what you do, but the the sense of humor is stellar, and that the bloopers just top it right off. But how many hours of outtakes do you have to choose from? A lot. <laughs> I I I. I I mean, I don't know what to ask without sounding like a fanboy because you you balance out the humor by having a good product. If you were goofy and did crappy work, nobody would watch you. But I mean, <laughs> but well, I mean, you, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of that's kind of the key. I mean, um, it's funny the, the the cigarette thing. I I kind of compare our shows to cigarettes. I mean, you know, at first, um, you know, you're coughing, you're hacking, it sucks. But before long, you're hooked. <laughs> and, you know, I think that's the formula for the show. I, I can't tell you how many times people have watched us the first few times, and they're like, these guys are stupid, I hate them, uh, you know, the humor's not there. But then when they actually watch the lesson, they're like, you know, Sheesh, these guys know what they're doing. I mean, the, you know, they're, they're putting out a, a, um, a real lesson, a woodworking lesson you can learn something from. Uh, so... And you know that's that's one of the the I think the the secrets to our show I wouldn't say the success because <laughs> and I still get a lot of people hating us but if they take the time to stick with it you know they'll realize that we play characters um, that we teach a real lesson and the whole hidden message behind woodworking is you know really have a good time don't take yourself serious I don't care if you've been doing it. You know, 30 years or 30 days, the whole thing is to always be uh, pushing yourself, trying to learn, trying to better, and, you know, share share your knowledge with others. And that's exactly what we're doing here. Great job at it. Well, that's what goes back to what I said. You know, I, <clears throat> I was born into woodworking. I've been doing it how long, Charles? Since I was knee-high to a grasshopper. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Charles always catches me on that one, but... Yeah, I was born into woodworking, but it's always been a love and a passion for me and having fun. But uh, I know a lot of people that that do uh, jobs that they don't have fun, that they're bored, they're tired of it. Uh, they're there to make a paycheck. So when you can combine something that you love, uh, something that you enjoy, uh, and do it at the same aspect, I mean, that's that's abs I know I said that before, but that's just great. Anybody else have any uh, a question? Well, they're all silent over there. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll say something in, in regards to our, our humor, our comedy again. Um, as I said, there's there's a large portion of people out there that aren't aren't favorable to my style, and um, I get that my style isn't for everyone. But one of the things I I take absolute joy in is the fact that uh, when people write me and they hate me and they, that you know they're bashing me. In a way, I'm making them feel good about themselves, you know, because they're they're feeling that they're better than us. That um, you know, this guy's so stupid. So by to complain about me, it's it's actually lifting their spirits up. And and seriously, like if you have to compare yourself to me, there's something wrong with you because um, just about everybody else in this world is better than me. And you know, that's that's. Fine, that's fine. So, um, yeah, I, I really think in the end, even though they hate me, it it makes them feel better about themselves. So, it's a uh, kind of like 
kind of the way I go with my videos. I put in the stupid stuff there because me, when I'm watching a video of somebody just going through the motions and doing the work and showing you how to do it, I get bored after a while. And it's just part of my sense of humor that I, I want to laugh a little bit. I'm learning while I'm laughing, so I got a feeling I'm not the only person out there like that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I did some teaching for a while with kids, and um, you know, I was taught you got to be real strict and rigid with these kids and that. And what I found was when I lightened up and when I was doing uh, jokes or comedy with them, they would remember the lesson better. And so I kind of carried that over into the whole woodworking thing, um, that if they are laughing and kind of chuckling, they might actually remember uh, perhaps the lesson. You know, if not, they can just have a good time knowing that. Because let's face it, how many times have you watched the video and it looks so easy and you go out there and you try it and, you know, you're frustrated? So if you can watch a video and kind of laugh along the ways. I, I think it takes some stress out when you go in the shop. That's like with me. I, I'm actually more alert when I'm cutting up and having a good time than I am when I'm sitting there watching the videos. Like the videos they used to show us in school for science. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I've got a little screen projector thing that goes by. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I grew up on Bugs Bunny cartoons, you know. I mean, I still love Bugs Bunny cartoons. So that's why I put a lot of the goofy sound effects in my mm -hmm. uh, videos. It takes a long time to do, but, you know, it's just, I don't know, it's just my kind of quirky humor. So. And I, I put in a lot of the things where I screw up because I see a lot of videos out there where they edit that out or it's done perfectly from each step. <laughs> And it just don't happen no. that way in real life. <laughs> We've never done that. <laughs> so if I screw up, it usually ends up in the video, unless it's something real bad that you know I just had to start the whole project over again to begin with. You know, I I teach um, classes and you know in groups and stuff, and the 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 last class I just did last month was down in Cincinnati, and there's about a hundred people, and I was doing a, a hand cut mortise and tenon uh, class for them. And uh, th they were surprised how long I was fussing to, to get it to fit just right. And, um, you know, that's, that's kind of what happens. It, it doesn't help when you have 200 eyeballs staring at you, too, to get it right. But, yeah, I mean, you you got to fuss and finesse things, and it's not going to be like on the videos. And, and we're all not Frank Klaus who can make two cuts and it fits perfect, you know. So... Um, it's, yeah, showing showing mistakes is okay. It's kind of a, as important to me to learn how to fix what you screwed up that's, because it's going to happen. That's exactly it. You know, I I mean, doing this for a living. Trust me, I mean, I, I make mistakes all the time, and and uh, knowing how to fix that, get the job done, still make it a quality piece. Um, and hopefully still, you know, make a, make some money out of it. But for me, the key is, um, you know, a really satisfied customer at the end and quality, quality overall. I will definitely take a loss on the job as long as the customer is, is happy. Always. I, I heard you and, uh, you and Dan get, get together. I mean, on the, I mean, did he, y'all already hung out, I assume, and you just convinced them to be on your videos? No, see, I was walking down the street past his house, okay, well, that's when my hair was real long, and he saw me coming down the street, so he went up to his door, went inside, and locked it. <laughs> so, you know, me, I had to see what was going on. I went up and pushed my face against the window. I was like, hey, what's going on? Why you do this? No, actually, we were neighbors. Yeah, Dan, Dan lives, uh, what, four houses down? Okay. And uh, right after I moved in, I set up shop, you know, in, in our two-and-a-half-car garage. And uh, the neighborhood kids would just, you know, wander down and kind of check out uh, what's going on. And uh, this kid walks in. He had, he had two pieces of wood. And he said, hey, mister, can you nail these together? And I said, well, what are you trying to do? He goes, oh, I want to make a sword. I said, ah, that's not a sword. So I go over and I pull some plywood off of the rack and, you know, I cut him out this giant sword, gave it to him. Well, of course, it didn't take long before he brought his buddy back, 
you know, so I made a sword for him, and within a couple hours, I made 14 swords that day for all the kids in the neighborhood, and one of the kids was uh, Dan's son, so the next day, I'm out in the front yard, and I, I see this guy walking down the sidewalk coming towards me. With the cigarette in his hand. And a wooden uh, sword. Yeah, you know, yeah, and a and a and a <laughs> you know, beer and you know, he's coming down the street the long bond here. And I'm yeah, and he's carrying the sword and I'm thinking, Oh my god, I'm in trouble. You know? why, why did you give my son a weapon? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just a little nervous and um and he came down and, and thanked me so much for that. And and we became, you know, instant friends and and so when I first started doing this show, he came up to me and said, I really like, you know, your formula. I like, like the, the jokes and the humor, the lightheartedness. He goes, can I be in a, a video, just one? And, you know, that kind of threw me for a loop because I'm thinking, where do I put this rough, tough east side guy in my show? And I remember... Um, I remember years ago, David Letterman had a feud going with Oprah Winfrey. I don't know if you guys remember this. So David you Letterman, call me Oprah Man? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're better looking. Yeah. Um, David Letterman wanted to be on Oprah Winfrey's show, and she wouldn't have him. And so David Letterman did, like, this countdown, you know, every day that he wasn't on the show. And one of the things he did was he had two uh, stage hands in the back come out every night and read transcripts of Oprah's show. And the the stage hands, uh, I'll never forget, the one guy was tall and mustache, and he had this cigarette dangling from his mouth as he would read the, the, the transcripts. And the cigarette would just bounce on that lip. I don't know how it didn't fall out. I was mesmerized by that cigarette, you know. And and the guy would read the lines in a deadpan voice, and and I, I never forgot that. And I was like, that's going to be the safety Dan character. Though though, and the whole safety Dan character is, uh, you know, in regards to the stupid lawyers that, you know, we have to be so careful to tell everybody, you know, tools are sharp and you can get cut. I mean, come on, it's like a no-brainer, right? I don't think they'll play when they're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the character really was kind of just mocking the fact that we have to be so PC correct. So I put a guy in it, you know, who's drinking and and uh, you know is is unable to to really give us any advice. That's that's the role he plays. So now, one thing uh, he's Dan plays that as a character, but one thing people don't realize Dan is not a woodworker. What does uh, Dan do? Um. Well, I put up fence. Yeah, but where do you put a fence? I put up fence everywhere. No, I I, I do all uh, all commercial fence, razor ribbon, prisons, stuff like that. He's an iron worker. Factories. Yeah. Have no idea what I'm doing with a piece of wood. <laughs> Prison <laughs> fence. I thought I recognized him. When I talked to you, you told me a story that you uh, y'all went somewhere uh, to a woodworking show or whatever, and Dan was along with you, and everybody was asking him questions or whatever. Oh, yeah, you I wanna, had no, can you I had tell no that clue. story again? Because I found that kind of amazing. Yeah. So um, <laughs> at the local woodcraft here um, hired me to do a demonstration, and and um, obviously, Dan is, is my friend, so he helps me lug in my stuff and set up. Well, when everybody saw him, you know, they're coming on, like, oh, Sage Dan, Sage Dan. And they're asking him all these questions, and he's like, I don't do any of this. He goes, I do what this guy tells me to do. <laughs> so, and, and you probably notice that when you watch the bloopers. I mean, our show is um, tightly scripted. I mean, um, Brett and I. Um, by the way, Russ, Brett wanted me to tell you he thinks your beard is absolutely awesome. He's jealous of that beard. Um, but Brett and I, we we um, we work on our scripts, and 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 that's that's kind of the way I like it. I mean, I, I, we we try not to ad lib on it. 
uh, that's, that was one mistake I made in the very beginning with my videos was I just thought I would talk and give all this information and what happens is, is you give too much information and the people get bored. Um, probably like, like they are right now. So. <laughs> um, but so I, I limited it to a script, just the key points of, of the, what we were doing. And, uh, you know, we put the jokes in that way. So, so yeah, Dan, when he was at the show, he goes, I just do whatever this guy writes and puts in the paper in front of me. So. Yeah, really, I, I, I don't have a clue. It's just like when, when you showed up on the screen, I thought that we were going to be on a Duck Dynasty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Chad, there's Cy Robertson, man. <laughs> Chad, is there anything... Uh, well, I know having to put a, a schedule out, I think you do videos for uh, a couple magazines and, and you do a YouTube channel. Are there projects you want to do but you haven't done because they take more time than you have? Uh, you know what? I, I'm glad you asked me that. Um, at the end of the year, um, as I said, Brett is kind of our man behind the scenes, and he, he runs all our computer uh, you know, website magic stuff. And he was doing the numbers, and he said, last year I only put out three videos on Woodshop and Time, which is pretty pathetic, you know. <laughs> Um, but we gained over 13,000 subscribers with those three videos. So, uh, you know, what that told me was that there's definitely a, a fan base out there that, that wants to see more. So, uh, yes, my schedule last year between um, building furniture and I, I do the series for popular woodworking called I Can Do That where I have to, um, uh, I, I mean, they let me design all the projects, and I have to build the props for it, as well as the finished, you know, product. It takes a lot of time, 24 episodes that we, we do a year for that show. Um, and then on top of it, trying to do witch shopping time episodes. But with uh, Brett's help, he's, he's thrown his hat into the ring, and he's helping me edit the videos now so we can get them out faster. Um, I've had some videos I filmed in the past of like what I call the technical scenes, the actual how to build it part. And now me and Dan are going back and we're doing the intro and the outro for it. So our goal this year is to um, put a video out every two weeks. And so far I think we have um, three videos out this year. So I've already matched last year's numbers. <laughs> well, congratulations on that. Uh, Dan, are you ever going to dance in the video? <laughs> no, I've seen what he does. That ain't happening. I'll tell you what. I wished I could do three videos a year and get 13,000 subscribers. <laughs> I mean, well, I, I, I'll do a video and get lucky to get 300 views. Well, okay, with that being said, I mean, with that being said, um, we've been doing this show eight years, okay? Right. Now, now, not many people realize that, and for the first six years, and Russ, I, I want to compliment you on this, because I think you said um, you, in your first year doing this, what, you got 1,500 subscribers, right? A little and, under. Yeah, well, at six years, that is where I was at. And and Brett came on board and he was pointing out what I was doing wrong. And um, thanks to thanks to Brett, in uh, two years now we we went from 1,500 to I, I think we're 21,000 or something like that. Um, the numbers are doing really well. So it's it's not necessarily who you are, but you know, knowing all that computer mumbo jumbo stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we've got uh, one of the questions uh, that we've got over on. I've got YouTube go up, and they, so we have questions. People are chatting over there and talking. Uh, oh, good yeah, uh, uh, Mark <laughs> Stallings wants to know where is a good place to buy a decent hand plane. Okay. Um, you know, hand tools. Uh, that's a nice question because hand tools is. Typically, what I like to gravitate towards, though I will say, 
of building furniture for a living, you know, obviously power tools are necessary to, to make your money. So I guess the question I need to ask him back is um, his budget. You know, it always comes down to when you're buying tools, you need to, to spend the, the most you can within the money that you have. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you can only afford a, a $500 uh, table saw, don't go out and buy a $2,000 one. Don't go into debt with it. But if you have that $500, don't go cheap and buy the $100 one. Um, you will definitely get out of the tools, you know, what you're putting into it. So when it comes to buying hand planes, myself personally, I have over 100 hand planes in my collection, and I use probably 15 of them on a daily basis. So they do get used. Um, I will buy mine um, off of eBay or at garage sales, but you got to know what you're looking for. So um, I'll throw this out there right now. If anyone is interested or has question in woodworking, they can uh, email me at Stanton Fine Furniture, uh, Stanton Fine Furniture at gmail.com. Yeah, that was and, another thing that we got. Sorry, I didn't know you were going to say something else. The uh, yeah. uh, viewers were wanting to know, or they were saying they would love to see the furniture if you have an area, a oh. website or whatever that shows all your furniture. Yeah, um, um, Brett is actually putting together a new website for me, but there is some of the photos there. Um, it's stantonfinefurniture.com. Um, so when they go there, most of the photos are there. I'll probably say like 70% of the photos are, are at the website. We're still kind of working out the categories and, and stuff. We're also going to start offering um, classes that people can, because I've had people write me and they want to take, um, you know, private classes to do more with hand tools. Um, I have three, a three-part series that we do uh, in hand tools in each project. Uh, teaches you more steps for the next project. It's, it's kind of exciting and fun. It's with limited hand tools too, so you don't have to go crazy. But if you have the money um, to buy nice hand planes, obviously you can't go wrong with anything from Lee Valley or um, who's the other? Um, Leo Neeson um, tools. But those are pretty pricey, and I, I myself only have a few of them. You'd be surprised what you can get at flea markets, garage sales, if you know what you're looking for. Um, <clears throat> we had somebody join us while we were uh, uh, talking and everything. Uh, Sterling, Sterling Davis. Hi, Sterling. Yeah, How Sterling. How hey. are you, buddy? Doing good. What's up, Chad? I was, I'm well, I'm well. Somebody said it was time to dance. So I <laughs> you know, actually, I got to laugh because um, – uh, Sterling and I, we were uh, a couple years ago doing the two by four challenge thing, and uh, some of the, the trash talk that we had going around. Um, it was uh, we came up with the idea of doing the trash talk to help generate some interest in the in the contest. And uh, Sterling put out one of the funniest videos. It, it's some kind of country song. I'm not a country fan, but yeah, it's some kind of yeah. country song, and, and in it. In it, he called Dan my uh, trophy wife, and uh, yeah, and we laughed like crazy over that. That was really pretty funny. So, Dan, you look lovely tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, was it your house I burnt down? No, that was oh, that was right. Dale Dale's okay. house we burnt. <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> yeah, when you were talking about the hand planes, I was just going to mention uh, a few seconds ago. So actually, Wacky Woodworks over there on YouTube. Uh, mentioned Lee Valley also and I was thinking the same thing Lee Valley uh I know that they uh their stuff is real expensive but boy they got some nice tools yeah I mean it's how can I say it um you know those tools are like Cadillacs you know they're beautiful they work great pretty much right out of the box you don't have to do much but you know I'm the type of guy who drives a Chevy so um, and and that does the job just as fine too so um, we're we're trying to how can I say it? I understand that everyone's got a different budget, and especially if you're starting out in woodworking, this is one of the things that frustrates me is 
there's all these companies out there that offer these um, tools and jigs and whatnot, and um, and they're expensive. I, I think uh, I think it was in 2012. I was told that woodworking was the fastest growing um, pastime hobby. So that means people got money to spend in this. But doing it as a craft, you know, for a living, it's not a hobby. And I know that some folks out there don't have that disposable money to, to throw away on a $200 hand plane. And I'll, I'll tell you a, a great example is I picked up at a garage sale a hand plane for, I think it was $6. And it was just a simple wooden coffin style hand plane. And it was putting out shavings almost as thin as the, the Lee Valley bevel up hand plane, which is like a 200 some dollar hand plane. I have it. <laughs> um, but I, I took my micrometers out and measured it. And I could not get over how close this hand plane of a hundred some years old was, was putting out shavings as nice. So you don't always have to spend a lot of money. But trust me, those tools are the Cadillacs, man. They're nice. I just uh, cleaned up a Stanley Number no. Six I got for thirty. Well, it was forty-four bucks with shipping and all that, and I didn't do the mic micrometer or whatever and all that, but it works fine. <laughs> <laughs> we got a suggestion over from uh, the YouTube chat saying they would love to see you do a one of your YouTube shows on. Uh, using hand planes and how to tune them up? Um, I do have scheduled for this year. Um, I bought a set of hollows and rounds from Lee Valley. Um, with this being said, they were the, um, the Hong Kong style hand planes. Um, I highly recommend these Hong Kong style hand planes. They are, um, first of all, the the price point on them is is perfect. They are not expensive, and the the precision of them is unbelievable. I have a, a really good friend of mine, Dennis Laney, who who's uh, 70 years old. He's been a woodworker for, geez, almost 50 years, and the stuff he puts out is amazing. It's like museum quality work. And I showed him one of these planes, and he kind of you know chuckled at first when he saw it. And then when he used it, he could not get over how good it was. And he then went out and bought one himself. And so, you know, you can get, get some good stuff out there at great prices. And um, I am going to do a video on how to do these hollows and rounds. And um, I've done a couple of blogs uh, on, on my website at woodshoppingtime.com uh, talking about uh, the basic uh, planes that are, are probably good that I call, I think I call it essential hand planes. Um, and, and it kind of tells you what's what you should have in your collection, uh, you know, if you're getting into this. But I like the suggestion of, of maybe I should pick one up at a garage sale and, and, you know, tear it down and tune the whole thing up to show everyone. So um, I think that would be excellent also. You know, I really don't want to embarrass you, but uh, you said you had an extensive... Uh, collection of hand planes. I've got a very, very extensive collection. Not only that, uh, I thought I would bring the collection out just for you to see. Okay. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> that is probably, let, let me ask you, does that have a lateral adjustment on the uh, the top What's there? a lateral adjustment? <laughs> so, so, okay, so it does not, okay. So that's probably a, a Stanley 60. Uh, which which is a, that's a good plane that you have the uh, depth adjuster on the back. Um, the uh, the lateral adjustment would be an arm just above that, so you could turn the blade, skew it a little bit. That you would be a Stanley. Story, yeah? No, that's just the uh, the lever cap that locks it down. Um, all in all, that's that's a good block plane to start with. Um, <laughs> Block planes really are kind of the, the workhorse of, you know, when you're woodworking on. I have I have mine on the bench. There is a designated spot it should live, but it never goes up there because I'm using it all day long. It's truly a great plane. It works good on end grain. 
Uh, I use it to remove the saw marks, you know, after you rip a board. Um, you can chamfer with them. I, I don't know. It's, it used to be a time that people carried the block plane in their um, apron out on job sites. You know? I remember my father having one with him all the time. There um, you go. Yeah, the, this is uh, sadly this is the only plane I have in my shop. Uh, and I told you the story today. Um, years, several years. I mean, we're talking about over ten years ago. I was doing some remodeling in a home, and they had some really nice wooden doors, but they were complaining about some of them sticking. And so uh, I, I went to the store and got this plane and brought them back, and was able to take you know plane the doors down so they wouldn't stick anymore. I created very little mess. Uh, we were able to sand the edges, and uh, they actually had stain uh, that matched. Uh, still had some stain that matched the doors and stained them and seal them. It was like you uh, hadn't even done anything to the door, but that's the only time. I mean, I've used it on other occasions for small stuff, but uh, that's the only time and the reason I bought this. So, I, I'm yeah, a no, I, I, I'm a I big gotta laugh. person. I got I gotta laugh because when I go out on job sites and and some of these trade guys, you don't know me. Um, when I come in, I, I have my hand planes, I have some hand saws, and uh, they call me Jebediah, you know, being Amish and stuff. Um, and, you know, at first they kind of scoffed and chuckled, but when they saw that I either, you know, trimmed it or planes or cut it faster than they could get their extension cord and find an outlet, you know, I'm done and walking out, um, a lot of them would come to me and say, you know, hey, can you uh, can you, you know, sharpen my chisel or can you uh, true up my planes and stuff? And I've had some local contractor companies hire me for private lessons because they're trying to make their guys become better finished carpenters. And um, a, a plane just like that, it kind of cracked me up. The guy brought it out in this class, you know, with the, the owner of the company. And he brings out this rusty little block plane. And he goes, "Yeah, I can't make this thing work." <laughs> you know, like, well, of course you can't like that. <laughs> yeah. So I told him, you know, to go get a coffee, take five minutes. And when they came back, I had it all cleaned up and and sharpened, and um, you know, the thing was working great. And they they were surprised at how how efficient a, a small little block plane can do. And uh, just another quick story. I was hired just two weeks ago up in Adrian, Michigan, uh, a little small cabinet making shop. Their main guy was out sick, and uh, they wanted to know if they could hire me for a couple of days. Yep, sure. So I come out there, and and they said, "Well, this is your bench." And the first thing I said was, um, "I saw they had some chisels." And I said, "Well, where's your sharpening stones?" And the guy goes, "What?" I go, sharpening stones, where's your sharpening stones? He goes, um, you know, I don't know. I said, okay, hang on. So I go out to my van and I had some. And that's the first thing I do, you know, on a job site is make sure my tools are sharp. So then I said, well, where's your, where's your, um, your, your plane, your smoothing plane? He goes, uh, we got something back there on the shelf, you know. And back there, the guy had sitting in the corner, there's it was all dust covered. A uh, 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 Miller's Falls number no. nine, really nice hand plane. Again, five minutes, trued it up, and so at the end of the at the end of the couple of days, the guy took me out to dinner and said, um, "I was watching you work last couple of days." He said, "You're watching me work? <laughs> Shouldn't you be doing your own job?" You know, and I said, "Okay," and he said, uh, "You know, I realize that." I'm not a woodworker. You're a woodworker. And I, I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you're, you're making shavings. He goes, we've never had shavings on the floor here. We've only had sawdust. And he goes, you were so methodical about the way you were going about it. He, he was really impressed. And, and I was surprised because I've been working alone for so long that um, it, it, it was surprising to hear, you know, these guys out there with their, with their, businesses um, just literally going through uh, churning stuff out like a, like a factory and not necessarily slowing down and taking the pride in the work. But at any rate, um, he, I talked with him today and he's using that hand plane and loves it. So, um, you know, 
I, I definitely should do a video on how to chew them up. So. I think it would be very good. Uh, you just should make sure that you understand, and I, I think most people understand. When I'm turning, it's not that I'm not listening to you. I'm watching the uh, you. I have another laptop set up over here, and I'm watching the YouTube and the chat over there, so that uh, to see if we have any questions. <laughs> hey, Russ, I just wanted to say I, I appreciate no, no it, but I um, I gotta run. But I just wanted to say, Chad, I appreciate all you do, Safety Dan. I enjoy the videos. Thank y'all for putting out what you do. I greatly appreciate it. It helps me a lot, and I and I hate to run. I just obligated myself somewhere else, and I. I uh, just walked in the door. I didn't think I'd make it in time for this, but uh, I, just, I was glad I was able to stick in and dance a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks, Sterling. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah. Good to see you all. Chad, you know you got you got to dance for this, this show. Is up. <laughs> <laughs> Chad, do you have a favorite kind of wood to work with out of all the ones you work on with? You know, um, I, I, I like maple, but I think that's mostly because... Um, my customers tend to request a, a wood that's kind of neutral. What I like about maple, it's hard. Uh, the grain isn't too wild. It isn't too loud. Um, I can stain it, you know, to get it to colors that they're trying to match. Um, so I work a lot with maple, but I definitely like using uh, cherry um, when I can, but you know, customers don't necessarily want to pay for that. Um, gosh, I don't know. Uh, it, it's hard to say what my favorite is, but um, I, I can see how neutral wood would be. You know, universal, not universal. I can't think of the word, but being able to stain it to a certain shade. My favorite to work with, being broke, is aromatic cedar. It's it's got the look, the softness, but it's brittle as heck, and probably wouldn't work real good for traditional furniture anyway. Yeah, it depends on the, the piece that that the customer wants. You know, I mean, so much of what I do is based on the uh, the customer's request. And, you know, I watched your guys' episode about pricing your work, and I, I got to say that every one of you, uh, I definitely could relate to, to each of you when it came to pricing your work, whether it was by the hour, by the day, um, by quoting it, um, I think the one fellow he's not on the panel there. You know, he said he asked if they have a uh, a budget, and what I what I found over the the 18 plus years I've been doing this, you know, you know right away if a customer is serious if they've done their homework. So if I get a call and they say I want an entertainment center, and I go out and visit them, I ask them right off the bat, well. You know, what do you have in mind? Typically, they'll show me some pictures online of something they like or features. And I know they've done their homework, and they also have seen what the price of those items cost, you know. Um, then it comes down to when they, when they say, well, how much? Again, at that point, I, you know, I'll tell them that they have three options. You know, they can have a good, fast, or cheap. And they can have two of the three, but they can't have all three. So they can have it good and fast, but it won't be cheap. You know? Don't you love it when you give them a price and they say, is that all? Think, God, I could have gotten more. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and see, that's why. You know, I, I do ask them if they have a budget in mind. And and I like I said, if they've done their homework, they've got an idea of what the piece will cost. Um, if, if they go, I don't know, what do you think? You know, that's the worst thing you can say uh, to them. You know, that's the worst thing you can hear is for them to say, well, what do you think? So if you ask them the budget, they'll try and throw it back in, in, in your face and go, well, give me an idea. And you can't answer that question because they'll hold you to it. And that's where I tell them, you know, you can have it good, fast, or cheap. What do you want? Um, when they realize that order... Uh, you know, you can have it fast and cheap, but it's not going to be good. You can have it good and fast, but it won't be cheap, and so on. Then they realize, you know, that you're a true professional, and they're going to get what they pay for on it. Um, 
but if it, you know if they're just shopping for price, that's that's not for me. I, I, I tell them I make stuff that they're gonna pass down for generations to their their family. If they want something just for the next five years, you know they can run the IKEA or Walmart or whatever. So I definitely don't want to make this about me, but on the the topic of pricing, I I struggle because it's art. It's not a necessity. Is you can incorporate scroll sawing into other things, but I tend to do <laughs> pictures out of wood. That's kind of what I'm known for. But uh, there's sellability, and you can do custom portraits. But I mean, it, it's the practicality. Furniture is used, so obviously your talent and the fact that you make usable things helps. But it, I, I struggle like heck when it comes to pricing. Art, well, artists will tell me that I don't charge enough. <laughs> I, I totally agree. I mean, what you do, Charles, and you know, by all means, I've seen the stuff on your website. It's phenomenal. And I was telling Russ this earlier that you know, you are besides the scroll work, just the drawings alone. You are an absolute artist. You know, and 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 let's face it, you haven't heard the expression "starving artist for nothing." You know, it's because. It's a high skill that is underappreciated, and I mean the work. The work that I've seen you do, I mean my jaw drops. And and I've even wrote you. I think the one time and asked you, how do you draw your hands? You know, what do you use pictures and that? And you're like, no, I just I look at my hand and I draw it. And <laughs> hands and feet are some of the toughest things for an artist to do, and you you do them amazingly. You know, uh, I appreciate um, that. It means a lot. Yeah, you're not telling that. Now his head's going to get three times bigger than it already was. <laughs> you know, but unfortunately, you're right. I mean, your work falls more into the category of, of art to be looked at and admired, where furniture is something that's used. And, um, you know, selling furniture alone is a tough battle. I think selling art is even harder. Um, I do some work for some artists, you know, I build some frames for them, and um, I'm doing some carvings for an artist. I, I can't post any of the pictures because he's incredibly protective about what he does, but um, I'll, I'll tell you this much, Charles, the tips that I'm picking up from him and how he's selling and, and moving his art, I will try and share with you, uh, hopefully. That hopefully get you to be able to break into that market because I think you need to move out of the, the whole woodworking thing and move closer into the, the art, you know, gallery, whatever, lifestyle. So, uh, you know. Uh, oh, that, there, that, that with me could come into shyness and, and not, not being good at pushing myself. I mean, I can push myself, but pushing myself to others or they say it sells itself but I, I'm not a good salesperson all my marketing is online <laughs> uh, you know what uh, like I said let's let's talk privately on this but the whole introvert thing you know that is what most artists are so most artists you know they need someone to sell their work for them because they are uh, you know an introvert a recluse person so um, you and I can talk privately on that, and like I said, whatever I pick up from from this other fella, I'll share with you. But uh, without a doubt, your work is amazing, and um, you know, unfortunately, this little group that we have here—I mean, we're all woodworkers, so we can appreciate what you do, but none of us probably have the money to be able to afford what you do, and and you need to take your ability and your your product to a, a, a higher level to the folks that have disposable income and want to hang that stuff up uh, in their office house and so on um, it, it's amazing though I, I was just in a job two weeks ago building some uh, cabinets for a bathroom that the fixtures listen to this the fixtures in the bathroom the faucets 90 thousand dollars and this whole house on every single spare spot on the wall had unique artwork from from different artists and that my friend is where you need to have your stuff hanging that's so. yeah, called too much money and then Russ I wanted to
apologize for us during the show. I didn't mean to make it about me. I just had yeah, a comment got, regarding pricing. Questions. That's all right. We got some questions. Katie Dotson over on YouTube. Uh, she wants to know: Have you ever worked or, uh, with Hickory, and how do you like working with Hickory? Yeah, Hickory. Um, I have worked with Hickory. It's very hard. I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna, depending on how much you're working with it, it's it's gonna dull your blades. You know, so be prepared for that. Um, I like Hickory the, for the fact that the the grain and tone color is extreme. You know, it has real lights and darks in it, so you have to be kind of a fan of, of that. Um, but, like I said, I work with what the customer tells me. I don't steer them to what I want. Um, I, you know, I work within what they are looking for. So, um, Chris, I, I saw you had unmuted yourself all ago. Did you have a question or something you wanted to say? Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, where did you come up with your projects for your, your videos? I'm thinking about the lantern one you just did. I happen to be working on a couple different lantern designs right now. So, uh, where did you come up with that one? Um, I'm trying to think. You know, the lantern one I actually did, what, almost two years ago. I yeah. mean, yeah. yeah, so that's what I mean. The technical scenes are, are, are pretty old. Um, I'm trying to remember how that came about. That's, you did for Kingcraft. Oh, Woodcraft. That's Woodcraft. right. That's right. Um, Woodcraft hired me uh, for some demonstrations for one of their, uh, I don't know, I think celebration. I don't know. They were open so many years or something, so they had me out there doing something. And they wanted some projects that would be, uh, you know, kind of user-friendly. You know, you didn't have to have a whole lot of woodworking uh, skills. And so we did the uh, the lantern. Plus, I thought the lantern was just absolutely fascinating when I researched it. I mean, to think that that was what they used in the Civil War, it seems dangerous to be, you know, yeah. running with those or with all your gear and whatnot. But uh, it, it, that's what it was. It was made out of white oak traditionally. And where I put the screws in, the one that I saw had dowels all the way through it. Wow. Um, but yeah, so uh, it, that was a fun project, but it actually has to be pretty precise. I mean, what you're seeing there in the video and and Donald, you know, the the mistake that we edit out, you know, <laughs> if if you have one of those uh, posts off just slightly, the glass that you cut to slide down in it, you know, is is really gonna play havoc for you. Right. So you really have to take a lot of precision with it. Well, now I have a house from that era, and I wanted to make some lanterns for it. And I've been researching them, and then suddenly your video popped up. I'm like, wow, perfect! So uh, I'm going to probably steal the idea. <laughs> so, so your house is what year? Built in. It was started before the Civil War, but didn't get finished till after. Wow! Uh, wow! Uh, it's 150 years old. Oh man, I it love this stuff. Shows every Dang. problem it has. <laughs> Dang Yankee house. Yep. <laughs> hey, yep, don't get upset because you lost. <laughs> the funny thing is, I find a lot of colonial designs from uh, the 1700s. But the reason there's not a lot of those houses left, they were all wooden boxes with open sides. And they would burn. <laughs> and yeah. take the house with it. Well, uh, I, you know, I was told that those houses where they have, you know, the porch that goes all the way around it pretty yeah. much is because of that reason that if there was a fire there was always uh, you know an escape route for them yes I have a wraparound um, porch well there you go yeah so <laughs> you got smoke alarms in there <laughs> uh, cover with them <laughs> <laughs> no I, I do a lot of work around here locally in um, historical homes and in fact the last house that I was working on was in uh, 19 or 1830 uh, I was doing some work in 18 and they had me um, replicating some uh, window sashes for it. So, and it was the Stanley 45 um, plane that was able to to uh, replicate the the mold on the window sash. So, it, 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 it's pretty fun stuff. Yeah, oh, I'm enjoying working on it. We're renovating it ourselves, a um, little at a time, but 
Yeah. Sometimes you hit a project, you got to hire the pro and bring him in. But uh, <laughs> most part, most of the woodworking we've done ourselves. Kitchen we did ourselves. So we're getting there. One more quick question before we close. Uh, Moy, uh, from Moy's Woodshop, wants to know: Do you talk? The customer into natural or stain, or would you paint the project if that's what they want? I mean, you know, it's all what they want. Um, I don't, I don't put my influence in at all unless I see them struggling or you know hesitating with something. If there's a, a part to the piece that they're not quite sure about. I'll offer my um, my vision or my view of what what it should be. Um, I did a desk mm, last year. I did a desk for a customer that um, was a professor for Aztec history, and he wanted like a Queen Anne style desk, but he wanted these carvings on it. Well, he uh, these Aztec carvings. Well, he came up with the idea of the Aztec carvings after I had the desk built, <laughs> which was a little out of the process because um, it wouldn't be easy to carve it into the, the legs and the drawer front. So I did w an applied carving. So all you scroll guys out there could relate to it. You know, I kind of cut it out and carved it and then applied it to that. Um, and, and, and that was probably a lack of of planning on his part you know he didn't think it all the way through and 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 I that's one thing I tell customers um, it's okay if we don't make a decision the day I come out and give you an estimate or talk to you about your project it's okay if we don't have it in writing right then and there because lots of times they'll think and they'll get these ideas that they want to add to it and um, you know that that's that's the best way to go because in the end they have to look at it every day not me you know and I want them to love it when they look at it every day but I don't steer them towards um, my my personal preference it's it's strictly what they want and the best way to do that is to look at what's in their house you know what what they like their style and then you design it around that I think uh, Charles had one more real quick question before we closed. Sure. I just, want, I just had to get two requests in. Uh, Dan, can you give us a G-rated safety lesson? And then, Chad, will you dance all the way out? <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, always make sure you wear your hearing protection and safety glasses. <laughs> and, you know, you know, I apologize. I hope I didn't just jibber-jabber my whole way through this show. I mean, um... I mean, all these guys that are here at the panel, I, I feel like I took away from them tonight. So. Well, I, I asked them if they had questions, and they could have, they know they can pop in anytime they want. So <laughs> it's if they didn't get a question, it is their own fault. I'm just here to be pretty and learn. So. <laughs> to be pretty. <laughs> we, we all got to go. Pretty pretty He's failing miserably oh. at one of them. <laughs> we, 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 got, we all got a dollar to fill seats. <laughs> No, as far as you running, that's that's totally fine. That's what the whole show basically is about. To having you and uh, Dan, I know Dan got kind of left out. He didn't get a, get a whole lot to say, but, but I, I was, it was that's fine. I tried, Dan. I tried. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you what. If you guys would like to do uh, another video in the future of um, you know like essential hand planes for your shop, you know if you'd like to know which ones um, that I think are worth buying and what features to look at when you get them. Um, we can do that. And, and knowing the fact that it won't work out in my shop, uh, you know, I'll make sure I get a little better uh, stage presence here for you guys. But um, sure. I'd be glad to do that. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. We'd love to have you back on and doing that. Well, yeah, <laughs> guys. Well, down there. So. We're, uh, yeah, oh, that's not all I get. So we can. Gotta get it in there, Chad. Uh, I appreciate it. <laughs>
I appreciate uh, having you, Chad. Uh, appreciate you, Dan. Y'all being here. Thank you very much. Also, no, thanks for uh, having us. Also on the panel, thank you, Charles, Chris, uh, Dave, Donald, John, and Russ. And thank you all, everybody that's been over there in the chat. I uh, had a good group tonight, uh, several questions. I really appreciate it. Um, now it's winding down to the end of the show, and just remember one thing. I tried this last week, and by George, I'm going to do it again. Thank you for watching. Just give me sawdust, lots of sawdust, <laughs> all around me and everywhere. I like it flying all around my shop and even in my beard and hair. Good night, everybody. God bless. You, you got a lighter and dancing. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs>